Hey, welcome everybody to Fire Safe Sonoma's monthly program called our speaker series. Thanks for everyone joining. So today we have a special guest and we're going to learn about sustainable understories and scotch broom management in Sonoma County. So um, yeah, welcome. And we're going to just get started here. It's just two shakes of a lamb's tail. So uh, I'm Roberta McIntyre. I'm president and CEO of Fire Safe Sonoma. And helping out today is uh, Marika Ramson. She is one of our paid staff at Fire Safe Sonoma. And also we have with us um, is Emily Pago. I'm still learning how to pronounce your last name, Emily. She's our newest paid staff at Fire Safe Sonoma. She's helping out today too, and of course, also behind the scenes helping with this presentation it are our two Climate Corps fellows, um, Rebecca Fisher and Harry Hubble. Um, last month, so thank you guys for helping out. I could not do this without you guys. I've tried it before years ago by myself, something like this, and it didn't work well. Gotta have the help to do a good job. So last month we had Chief Baker from Sonoma Valley Fire and Rescue on the program. He uh, was doing an informational about the Measure H uh, item that was on Sonoma County's ballot. Uh, and that was a sales tax measure to provide funding to help bolster fire services throughout Sonoma County with a particular emphasis as part of the whole package on wild land fire safety and risk reduction, which quite honestly will benefit Fire Safe Sonoma, um, you know, to keep us able to do the work that we do for y'all. And then next month, we're gonna have uh, Cal Fire uh, Chief Nichols. He's a division chief for the LNU, our unit. Uh, and he's gonna give us the seasonal outlook this year for wild land fire safety. Um, and then, of course, as I alluded to a moment ago, this month we have Jason Mills. Um, and Jason Mills is with, um, oh, shoot, uh, um, the name's not in my script. A college, re uh, help me out, Jason, with the name. Ecological of Solutions. Rebecca. Thank you. Thank you. Ecological yeah. Solutions. Sorry. Yeah, Jason uh, did a presentation for us way back uh, a long time ago, uh, back when the Zoom thing was brand new. He, he did a little presentation, which is probably a Reader's Digest version of what he's going to cover here today. And we wanted to bring him back to do a real thorough presentation on uh, some very important things to consider, particularly with regard to the environment when, we, when you're doing some types of this fields reduction work. Um, he's a, a fire uh, and restoration ecologist and he's a licensed uh, landscape contractor. He holds a C27 license uh, and tree service contractor with a D61 contractor's license. He's got over 20 years of experience managing natural resources for public agencies, nonprofits like us, and private landowners throughout Northern California. His accumulated skills began with the AmeriCorps program for Golden Gate National Recreation Area um, to what he's doing now is currently advising on or directly carrying out vegetation management, fuel reduction, and defensible space projects for the community and environment of Sonoma County through Ecological Solutions. There's the, there's the name of the company. Oh my gosh, how long have we been working together? Don't get old people, it's not for young people. You start to lose things like your memory and your car keys. Um, and then of course, Jason continues to monitor the efficacy of field practices and has reported his results for statewide conferences, including the Society of Eco Ecological Restoration the California Botanical Society, the California Native Plant Society, and the California Invasive Plant Council. And I could share with you a bunch more stuff about Jason. Uh, you know, we just don't have time for that right now. So with that, Jason, I'm gonna hand the baton over to you. Uh, and I'm just gonna turn my video off and enjoy this fantastic presentation. 
Thank you so much, Roberta. It is my pleasure to have the opportunity to do this on behalf of FireSafe Sonoma. Uh, it's been a wonderful organization to partner with over the years, and I really appreciate the support to get this the hard get the get the word out on this hard work. Um, I've been at it, you know, for 20 years now, 20 plus years. I've been battling broom over those years substantially. It's become kind of an arch nemesis for me. Um, I love to see the work done well, uh, and that's really the point of the presentation today. So I'm going to get into some real strategic approaches on broom and uh, and then talk about how we should be managing forest understories, too, for fuel reduction projects to really have a, a holistic approach to what we're doing with vegetation management out there. And I'm going to be sharing uh, projects I help lead with the Sonoma Ecology Center and WRA Landscape Restoration, but I'm currently running my own shop now as the uh, contractor and ecologist for ecological solutions. And we're just a resource for the community to help carry out this work. Uh, here is a shot of a pretty serious broom infestation. I like to open with this because it's a mix of scotch, of both scotch and French broom. And that's confusing for people. Uh, they're both introduced invasive plants from Europe, from the Mediterranean. And, uh, um, basically, how to tell them apart, uh, French broom has smaller flowers, which you'd think would be a good thing, but it actually leads to more seed pods and uh, a bigger reproductive output. Uh, the plant also physiologically grows much quicker than the other brooms. Um, I, I forgot to change the second Scotch broom there to Portuguese broom. So Scotch broom and Portuguese Room are actually related. Their flowers, I'd say, are two to three times larger than French broom, and that means they produce less seed pods. They also grow slower, so they're not quite as eruptive in terms of invasibility. Uh, they kind of stay put for a little bit, but they, they run rampant through the Pacific Northwest, so um, I think that's why a lot of people think of broom as scotch broom, but here on the central coast of California, we're really dealing with French broom. And uh, that comes into play when you're dealing with managing these plants because the French broom has a much smaller taproot, fortunately, than the Scotch broom. So um, that really lends itself to uh, manual removal, which I'll get into. And what we've seen with uh, the brooms, especially the French broom, are those little seed pods that erupt every summer uh, just produce these rich seed banks. And so one plant of French broom is capable of reaching you know, heights of 10 to 15 feet, and they can produce as many as 5,000 seeds per plant. Those seeds are, are very highly viable too. So of those 5,000 seeds, many will germinate. And what you see here on the picture on the left is a post-fire eruption of a broom seed bank following, a, I think it was a 2017 Nuns fire in the Sonoma Valley where it comes up thick as carpet. And so, you know, when you're looking at managing invasive species, best case scenario, you get on it early. So here you can see the exponential growth of typical invasive plant infestations. And if you don't get them on early, they tend to increase over time and require more and more resources to control. Um, why are invasive species an issue? Well, they not only dramatically increase biomass by forming these monocultures of just one species, but they also, in the case of broom, produces a lot of woody ladder fuel. And that, that ladder fuel poses a significant risk towards bridging what would be low severity fire to high severity crown fires. So it's a significant fire threat. And when you look at the profile of a typical woodland without broom, there's a natural gap between the understory and overstory. Um, this is a photo taken from Jack London Park on Sonoma Mountain, and there broom hasn't been able to establish in this particular area. And what you have there is a continuous understory of perennial native grasses, and those help hold the soils in place. Um, they're great for the ecology. They help filter the water. 
and uh, they stay green. They're perennial. They go into the fire season holding water. And uh, you can see that natural gap there. Um, in these areas where broom isn't present, where we have fire, oftentimes it is a low severity burn and the woodland ecosystems are somewhat resilient to this low severity fire. This one um, right by my place in the Montini Preserve, uh, you can you know hardly even tell it didn't get into the trees at all. Now, this is more symptomatic of an area where you have a broom infestation. You can just see the ladder fuel there. This is in Santa Rosa, and that ladder fuel produces a ton of heat in the overstory canopy of these trees, even though they're adapted to fire, if that heat is too much, it can roast them. And when the tree's cambium gets severely damaged, they can't bounce back. And I think what we're going to see here is increased broom spreading with fire, increased fire frequency, and we're slowly gonna start losing our oak woodlands and our woodlands at large to invasive monocultures of broom. So it's something that's really important for us to get ahead of and start controlling. We look at how the heat impacts, you know, these hardwood trees that are generally stump sprouters. They've got epicormic growth. They can bounce back after fire. But if they really cook and that cambium gets damaged, they can't bounce back. And, uh, you know, you would think after fire, the, the biomass would be reduced from all that broom burning out. But unfortunately, broom is also fire adapted and used to the Mediterranean climate of fire. And so it fortifies its populations with deep seed banks that kind of erupt and flourish post fire. So you end up with more fuel after the fire than before. And there are a bunch of different techniques you can use to control broom. Um, here's one that's pretty unique. Uh, using a, a propane blowtorch to essentially roast the seedlings. And this is very effective immediately following a burn event or a pull where you have that flush of seeds. And the, the most important thing is to get at them right around now uh, when the ground is really wet in the spring and they just first start to germinate. So the first true leaves come out and they haven't produced any woody tissues yet. Um, if you are to use a propane torch, you will need to bring fire suppression uh, materials along with you, and it's probably not recommended close to any structures or sensitive areas. Now, what I see a lot of people doing is uh, getting out there and mowing the broom. I think this is some maybe my biggest takeaway of this presentation is whatever you do, please don't mow broom. Uh, when you mow broom, it is a stump sprouter itself, and it quickly shifts the energy down to the root mass and resends sprouts in it. So it's out of, si out of sight, out of mind, immediately following the mow, but then it's going to come right back. And that's what happened here in Fountain Grove, Santa Rosa. Many of you probably drive by this and see the ocean of French and Scotch broom out there. This was mowed in, I think, 2019, and here it is in 2021 just completely flushed back. Then they went through and sprayed it all. Unfortunately, spray is pretty tough with broom. You have to get almost an entire plant covered with every leaflet covered in order for it to uptake the amount of chemical to actually get a kill. And getting total coverage on broom is easier said than done. So what I see a lot of the time with spray jobs on broom is about 85% of the plant will start to die back, but that 15% that hangs on ends up regenerating. And in the end, you're not even getting a kill and you're putting more and more chemicals out into the environment. So it's not a good method. Um, other things that I see happen with uh, private landowners who are trying to do the right thing. Uh, this fellow after the 2019, 2017 burns paid a landscaping crew to come out and mow all of the broom and then dispose of all of the broom. This is after that investment was made. So, you know, a big thing aside from just not mowing the stuff is thinking about disposal because disposal ends up being probably as much as the removal effort itself, if not more. And so what I recommend is doing the work now in um, 
March and April when the plants are flowering so you can find them all. And uh, if you do it now, when the plants are in flower before the seed pods have matured, the seeds aren't viable and you can spread and lay down the plants all over the ground and they will rot and decompose on their own, saving you the cost of disposal. Now, if you're you know, close to structures or sensitive areas, you might wanna do you know, green waste dump runs, but you'll save a lot if you can get away with not doing that. Um, here's another big deal with brooms. Brooms come in on roadsides in a major way and their seed moves hydraulically and it tends to infest um, equipment. So what we have here is Cavedale Road, one of my favorite spots in the valley. It got funded for a um, shaded fuel break roadside project and they did a great job limbing up all the woody material, but then they mowed the broom. Now the brooms come back thicker and not only thicker, it's come back in areas that didn't exist before getting tracked in with the equipment. What's especially bad about these roadside populations is not only do they continue to get in, in tire treads and spread up and down the roads from there, but they also launch off of the off of these roadsides and invest in infest wildland areas of intact uh, native plant communities and spread rapidly that way. So how do we deal with it? Um, we work with the community to try to get engaged with getting access and interest to address these populations on a, on a larger scale. And that's really critical to the whole to the whole thing is we want to go after the source populations. We don't want to waste energy and resources downstream when the root of it's coming in from above. So uh, it's really important to track the populations through the watershed, figure out where their source is, start there and start driving it down the watershed. Here, I was working with a wonderful landowner, uh, David Cost, who reached out to his neighbors and was able to get traction on a project right out of Glen Ellen and Wind Creek. And there's uh, Sarah Gibson, the local fire marshal, standing in front of a wall of uh, Genista Monspeciulana, the French broom. You can see there it's easily 10 feet and just a solid, bioma a solid mass of a monoculture of biomass. Uh, just dumping seed and increasing fuels. Um, now, mapping is a really important consideration when you're getting into broom work, and that has a lot to do with the scale of it. So um, here I did a big project for Point Reyes National Seashore. They have an area by Drake's Estero that's completely infested with scotch broom. Uh, the populations are kind of spread out, but uh, a mix of densities. So to map all this stuff could take a really long time if you go out there with units and have to walk all the polygons. What I've found to be really effective is to use a tablet and you can get a program called Field Collector. I think there's a variety of them out there now. And it allows you to draw polygons around the populations right there on your screen. So it saves us a ton of time and you can be really accurate with it. If you have a nice tablet with a pretty big screen, um, I call it throwing points, but you can just draw those polygons off and get a pretty good idea of what you're dealing with on a large scale. The other really important mapping application out there that I like to advocate for is CalFlora. CalFlora is important because unlike data you collect that's your own private data that stays within your files, CalFlora is a public medium that, that shares all of the information you record, and it's a public database. This is a powerful tool because you can go back through time and see where management efforts have taken place, and you can figure out who did that and reach out to them and pick up where they left off. You can see where areas haven't been tended to. So every time I take on an invasive plant project, I, I like to record the management that has happened and entered into CalFlora. Um, here's some other mapping uh, techniques here. So, you know, since broom seed moves hydraulically, it tends to go down drainages. And it tends to move downhill. So what I like to do is bring up some terrain maps. So you can use topographic maps. You can use whatever works. Here I used um, LIDAR. And LiDAR just creates this kind of moonscape image you can see there on the left. 
And what that does is it 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 allows you to see the lay of the land and the terrain. And what that that helps us do is kind of scale our treatment to fit the best mold for the project. So, um, you know, it's pretty hard to take on big acreage of broom. So what we try to do is dial them down into management units within each drainage and chip at them, chip away at them. And uh, that makes it much more manageable. And you can actually tailor your budgets to bite off what you're able to take on. Um, and that's what we did here on a, on a big private parcel down in Marin County that was going to become an eco center. And uh, it's invested. It's, very heavily infested with broom. So what we did there, I kind of looked at the access road and the drainage and the source population above. And what we did is we started with yellow polygon, flushed all that out in year one. Then we jump over to the red, flush that section and return back to the yellow. And that is a really important concept and it has to do a lot with the life cycle and reproduction of broom. Um, and this this is really important. Broom, it grows vigorously. It grows from one to two feet a year. Fortunately, it does not produce flowers from two feet down. So if you have a disturbance, if you've done a pull effort, you have two years to return to that population before it makes new flowers and sets new seed. So what I like to do is called the hopscotch approach, where I do what I did in that previous slide, I, I clear one section and then I hop over to the next, clear that section and then return to the previous section and bounce back and forth. So essentially you have to do that three times per area. So you're looking at a six year total investment to actually knock back your broom. I, I shoot for eradication. It's a bold word, but you can get control of it. And really the heavy lifting is done in that first four years. The first two poles, usually the first pole, flushes all that seed, and that's just what you want. You want to generate that seed. You want to flush it out. People get discouraged when they do their first broom pole because it comes back thicker, but that's what you want. After you get the second pole, then now you've really diminished it. And in the third cycle, you're probably down to anywhere from 20 to 15% of the whole population. So your budgets can decrease, your total staff can decrease and uh, it becomes much more manageable. Um, tools that are out there to do this, manual work. Um, oftentimes, broom, when it's slender and young, you can just pull it with your hands with some good gloves, and it's amazing what you can do. I think that's why I love doing it, because you can get out there and manually make a big impact and clear a bunch of space. Um, when when it's been mowed before or once it gets pretty big and it's harder to pull out of the ground, then we use these weed wrenches. There are a bunch of different models out there. Uh, the orange one in the middle is the original weed wrench. The white one to the right is a Canadian model called the Polar Bear. Um, and then the ones on either end are two different sizes of extractigator weed wrench. And that's the model I probably recommend the most. Um, the original weed wrench is out of production. The polar bear tends to strip when you try to pull it. The extractigator grabs it well, and it's kind of ergonomic to pop it right out of the ground. They are heavy. They are cumbersome. So depending on access, it can be an issue. Sometimes I like to actually get the small one, the kid's version, just because it's a little more lightweight and uh, handy. And here, uh, a fellow at our forest working group conference had a uh, customized a shovel to be able to sink it in the ground and pop the tap root out. I think that's a clever idea. Uh, I like trench shovels a lot for that too. And here's just some action shots of uh, what we're able to do out there. So we came in another post-fire site in the valley here, Oak Hill Farm. It was incredibly thick. There's a lot of poison oak. Um, it's sort of situation where you might want to hire professionals to, to knock it out. So we went in there, we, we average about a half an acre a day of dense broom um, is, a, is the mark we try to hit. If it's less dense, we can, try, we can aim for an acre. Here's that project I, I pointed out with the red and yellow polygons doing the roadside. We're able to jam that out, I think about a mile of road in a week. 
And then there are volunteers. And that's something I think is an amazing resource that's wonderful to tap into. There are a lot of great organizations and people ready to get into it and start st stewarding their wild lands. And uh, it works out well with Earth Day, MLK Day. We're able to get um, volunteers out there. This is on the Sonoma Developmental Center Habitat Corridor area on the SDC. And when I uh, got into this project, we were working with a Coast Conservancy grant. We had a, somewhat of a budget for invasive plant control. And I said, okay, let's get after this broom. A coworker said, why would you do that, Jason? The broom is everywhere. Why would you try to take this on? And I said, well, what's the alternative? The alternative is we do nothing and walk away and watch these plants become 15 feet and overtake all of our wild riparian forest. I, I don't like that option. So th that first poll was in 2018. We came back with another group in 2020, two years later. This was a group of uh, kind of wild bartenders from San Francisco, but they were out of their element, but they really enjoyed doing the work and we were able to get a lot done in just a day. And then I go out, you know, I, I try to talk about how to effectively manage this stuff, but, you know, it's just my opinion unless I back it up with some data. So on this one, I was able to get a, get ahead of it, run some transects through it, um, document the cover through time. And uh, what you can see are some pretty amazing results. So just in this spectrum of time, from 2018 to 2022, we're, we were able to knock out that super dense population of French broom. There are, there are still some plants coming back but it would take a fraction of the resources to walk that area and pull the, the individual plants to keep this clean. Um, it's interesting though, to think about, okay, now we've controlled it. Now we have it knocked out. Now what do we do next? And that's where it shifts to, you know, un understory management, something we very rarely talk about in the fire fuel reduction field, but it is so critical. And it is so impacted with heavy equipment use and masticators and skid steers that just go in there and crush everything. Now, you know, why is that a problem? Well, you have erosion, you have disturbance. What comes with disturbance? More invasive species. You're wiping out the biological diversity that's hard earned that evolved to occupy all those niche roles in the ecosystem. These plants also oftentimes hold water into the fire season. So they, they help to slow wildfire. And that is very important for low severity burns. These ferns, right? They're, they're pulling so much water out of the ground and they do, do not pose any sort of fuel threat. If you run equipment through here, you're gonna stop them all out. They probably won't come back. Um, but here's just a variety of native ferns we have out in our forests. Uh, upland environments, riparian environments, wood fern, sword fern, maidenhair, goldenback, tons of finger ferns, coffee ferns, lady ferns down in the streams. Pretty special. We also have our graminoids, our rushes, our sedges, and our, and our grasses. These are a little tricky. There's all, nearly a thousand species of juncus and the rush rushes around. There's nearly a thousand species of sedges, the carex have edges. And then we've got our perennial grasses. Uh, you know, you think of these graminoids being short-lived, but these things can live for hundreds of years and they hold water. This uh, most common rush of them all, Juncus patens, the spreading rush here on the left, we couldn't get it to burn. At a prescribed fire event at the Van Hoosier Preserve, this plant had gas dumped on it with a drip torch. It still wouldn't catch fire. And this stays green year round. In the heart of the fire season, these plants are still green. The grasses, the fescue will die back a little bit, but the rushes and the sedges, they hold their own. And if they do burn over, they sprout right back. So they make great ground cover. And then this time of year, go out on a walk, you can see some amazing spring wildflowers. Um, these plants are also great at holding water and slowing erosion and providing resources for pollinators and support wildlife. And there's just such an amazing diversity of uh, flora in Sonoma County. I think it's over 2,000 species. We're, we're losing them. 
and we'll continue losing them if we do sloppy veg work. And as more funding comes into this work, we need to be doing it right. We don't need to, we, we shouldn't be wiping out um, habitat with, with fuel reduction funds. We should be stewarding the lands and we can achieve both when it's done well. Um, and then you think, okay, well, why are these invasive plants there? Well, they're introduced and what they do is they overtake areas but they're a symptom of disturbance and they're actually providing a niche ecological role. So once you are able to control them and get them out of there, you could think about putting some good guys back in there and making it a little less invasible. And that's what I think of as holistic restoration. And you know, the brooms, they're legumes, they're nitrogen fixers. They pump the soil full of nitrogen. They make rich soils to reinforce their own populations. And uh, when they're gone, we have plenty of native wild legumes, all of our lupins, all of our wild peas, and then there's obscure things like this California tea, uh, Riparia physoides. I saw a population of this in a wooey area over by Oakmont. It makes a green carpet in the middle of August, comes up four inches high, holds water, spreads rhizominously. That's the plant we want in our understory. And, you know, when you get into actually, you know, woody vegetation out there, um, when you're doing your shaded fuel breaks and when you're doing your forest thinning, uh, there we have a bunch of native shrubs. The native shrubs, they can grow in thickets, but they also grow isolated, right? They don't make those continuous monocultures. Not every woody shrub poses a ladder fuel threat if it's properly spaced. And they're all, you know, many of these plants are producing berries that are great resources for wildlife. You can kind of tell them apart. You know, the coffee berry has that smooth leaf, the smooth, simple leaf. Um, and the seed actually looks like a coffee bean, not edible, but edible for wildlife. The toyon, you know, our, our uh, Christmas berry or Hollywood, um, another great resource for wildlife. So oh, that one has a serrated margin on the leaf, so you can tell it apart. And then the uh, silk tassels of all the garias, they have this wavy leaf, more typical to the coast range. And snowberries can have a pretty significant presence in the understory. They spread rhizominously in wetter areas and uh, only grow about two, three feet, three feet high. And then there's the, uh, of course, the manzanitas. And uh, manzanitas are really a significant part of our local ecology. Uh, their epicenter of evolution on the planet is the San Francisco Bay. And they fan out from here all the way into the arid lands of Utah before they kind of fizzle out through the West. So we have a mix of so many different species of manzanita. And here on the coast range, they tend to grow a little differently than they do in the Sierra foothills. Sierra foothills, you have, you know, chaparral thickets of, of continuous manzanita. Those do pose fuel threats if you have structures above on steep grades below. But what that's done is it's kind of villainized manzanitas or arctostaphylis at large. And really what we have on the coast is different. We'll have isolated manzanitas that don't pose continuous ladder fuel threats. And uh, the way you can tell these manzanitas apart they are split roughly 50-50 down the middle between those that produce burls and those that which don't. The manzanitas which do not produce burls depend on seed set to survive. And that is their method through, uh, through uh, fire adaptations. And so what we have at large is we are losing our obligate cedar uh, manzanitas with increased fire frequency. And we're seeing populations start to decline all the way from LA to here. Whereas the obligate stump sprouters are hanging on. So they, they can recover just fine after fire. That might have to do with when these fires are happening, how often they're happening. But here in Sonoma County, we're seeing our obligate cedar manzanita start to decline. And you can also do some good out there when you're going after the ladder fuels, but just targeting some other invasive shrubs. Um, these 
many of these invasive shrubs, privets, I didn't include the trees, but their berries are actually toxic to wildlife. So the cotone aster produces these toxic fruits um, and also spreads to form monocultures. So you can tell the cotone aster, it has a white underside to the leaf. Uh, the berries mimic toyon, so I think it's confusing to birds which eat them, get poisoned, and spread them. So that's a good one to, to knock out, too, when you're out there. And that's what I have for you guys. Um, I did a little snapshot earlier. forgot to take that off. But uh, this is my team. We're here as a resource to help. I'm happy to stick around and answer any questions anyone should have. And uh, thanks so much for having me for the presentation. All right. Fantastic. That was a very stunning presentation. And um, every time I have the opportunity to hear from you, Jason, whether it's in a formal setting like this or an informal setting, I learn so much. Um, getting a little teary eyed there. It's just so cool that you're such a wealth of information and so helpful to so many of us. So thank you. So, we do have some questions in the queue. Um, I don't see any questions on the YouTube. Harry will let us know if there are. Um, let me get down to the questions. So um, I think you covered some of this, but you know, I think each of these questions, whether you covered them or not, bears uh, repeating. So is there a time or season when you can burn broom to remove it? You mentioned that it's hard to burn yeah. it, completely eradicate it, but uh, do you want to speak to that a little? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. I mean, when you're looking at just like acreage of broom, it's pretty tempting to think, okay, we could run fire through this. Now, when you do it, you can do it to suppress the reproductive output. It's just burning all that biomass to prevent it from setting seed. Unfortunately, that's probably not going to really set it back too much because the seed bank is going to flush or it's going to stump sprout. So the timing of when you do it is pretty critical. And the resources required to do it are also pretty intensive because you're not dealing with a grassland prescribed fire. You're dealing with ladder fuels and forest settings that can get away from you. So, um, you know, I think burning broom and grasslands would be a lot more practical than trying to burn it in forest understories. I'm also a little concerned with run, running fire through regularly, right? Because as, as we increase fire frequency in our forests, we could start to hamper the growth and development of all of the native understory plants that are hanging on under those broom populations that help to kind of reestablish once we've manually pulled it all. So that's why I kind of advocate for manual removal, but I know there's a big push to have fire as a primary tool for managing our wild lands. And I think we'll see kind of the impacts of that in the coming years. Okay, next question, thank you. Next question, for steeper hillside, poles of mature broom where slope stability is a real concern. Can you recommend the best approach? Um, oh, yeah. Solid boots. Um, oh, this, yeah. this person said they've tried, uh, let's see, we have tried cut close to soil and strip out outer bark in late summer and are considering cut and paint um, uh, on with something like in my zapper. I'm not sure what that is. Mazapir. Yeah, that's a, that's a strong chemical. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that'll get a kill. Um, yeah, working on slopes, it's a mixed bag. You know, a lot of this stuff, I remember when I started leading volunteers on TAM, uh, we did, um, uh, my boss at the time said, oh, Jason, you, we can only take them to, you know, uh, friendly locations on flat ground with no poison oak. And I said, well, th that's not where the seeds are coming from. They're coming from the slopes above. Why would we spin our wheels down here? The volunteers are here to make an impact. Um, so I think there's there's a place for hired help, and there's a place for volunteer-type work. Um, when the terrain gets dangerous and steep, it's actually kind of, in some cases, helpful for pulling broom because you can kind of use 
you know, the, the leverage there to strip it off of the hill. Um, but, you know, it, on really steep slopes, we can go so far as using repelling equipment like we've done in the headlands. And so, um, yeah, it's a tricky one. I, I, I tend to have a sensitive place for emergent populations in rocky, steep chaparral because I know they're going to, over time, start spreading where the access is nearly impossible to reach. And once it gets to that point, you're never going to be able to contain it. So um, when you see emergent isolated populations starting up on steep areas, it's really good to get them before they can take off. And I think uh, stripping the cambium like that, uh, I think that's a good move. Um, in a Mazapir cut and paint, we usually do the glyphosate or the um, garlons for cut and paint treatments. Uh, Mazapir is a pretty serious chemical that will actually leach and spread to kill surrounding vegetation, but um, it's a good one to use if you really need something gone. Okay. And hiring a licensed qualified applicator would be the way to go. Yeah, okay. looks like we have a lot of time for questions. That's good because... We're getting some real good questions. Good. Uh, can you recommend an overseeding mix to repopulate oak woodland? You kind of alluded to this a little bit too, I think. Yes, that's a great question. I heard about this. I got really inspired by one of my old bosses who told me down in the Marin headlands surrounding the Golden Gate Bridge in the 80s, they started pulling French broom there and they were trying to enhance a habitat for the rare mission blue butterfly whose host plant is the silver lupin lupinus albifrons so they actually direct seeded into broom pole areas and it i guess did really well and they had all this native lupin flourish where the where the uh, french broom was and so i think using relatives of the invasive species so in this case broom fabaceae legume we have all our, our native legumes. Um, so that's what I would recommend as a seed mix. And lupins are available commercially. Uh, our wild peas might be harder to find, but if you write the if you pursue the right native plant nurseries, uh, Larner seeds, um, Laguna Foundation, uh, Calflora, uh, there are resources out there for, for finding you really want like watershed specific or it, it, at least county specific genetics anytime you're doing revegetation or reseeding. Okay. Um, good. Uh, over your time working in the county, have you seen the broom problem get better or worse? I think I can answer that, but you're the expert. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wish I could say better. I really do. I really wish, but I see, I, I have seen a good amount of resources drained with fuels increased and habitat degraded. And that's why I'm here. That's why I do this is uh, I really think we need to start working together to do informed work to benefit the environment and the community. And uh, that's not to say they've all been losses. We have victories, but there are quite a few uh, kind of in your face uh, that we can improve on. Yeah. Yeah, I remember years ago before I even knew much about, you know, French broom or Scott broom or any of this, um, we were trying to help some folks eradicate some broom up on Fitch Mountain and outside of Healdsburg. And that was my initial introduction to the problem. And oh, yeah. even back then I was told, and we want to just get some community folks out here and just the right time of year get out here and pull all this, you know, because it's just it's just work. Oh yeah. I when I was working for the water agency in Marin, they've been mowing the same broom populations for 40 years straight. They just call it maintenance. Just go out and mow it again every year. And I got down there and tried to pull the roots. The roots were as big as footballs. So at that point, I don't know what you do. You've either got to nuke it with some chem or dig it out with big equipment or just you've got yourself a perennial uh, perpetual never-ending maintenance project right yeah oh my gosh all right so we got another question if we this is a little outside the scope but i think you could probably answer it 
If we wanted to grow native plants, what type of soil should we use in the pots, assuming they're going to have potted plants? For instance, what soil would be good for the California tea? Yes, yes. So this is a big deal as far as uh, sudden oak death goes, because if you're out planting into wild lands, uh, we have a real issue with Phytophthora and sudden oak death. So what we're really pushing for in the industry is to follow best management practices when we're growing native species to get out planted into wild areas. And that involves using sterilized soil, uh, having plants elevated off the ground because disease spreads with water and keeping our uh, everything really clean with isopropyl alcohol. Um, so those are kind of the growing conditions. As far as soil type, you don't really need anything high nutrients. And uh, they generally do require some drainage. Um, so it's pretty much a typical potting soil. But if you can find something that's been sterilized or steam cleaned, um, it goes a long way. Yeah, we have a couple questions from YouTube, uh, which is cool. Uh, do Scotch slash Spanish slash Portuguese follow the same two-year cycle of seed dispersal? Mm, that's a really good question. They grow so much slower. I wouldn't think so. I don't know firsthand, but I... I I haven't seen scotch brew. It's more like half the grow speed. So it's probably hitting about a foot a year. And I would think it would need to hit two feet before it starts producing flowers. That's a great question. Um, second question from YouTube. Is there, and I'm kind of curious about this too. Is there any benefit to spraying patches immediately after pulling by hand uh, when it's only small sprouts left? Mm, spraying at, right after you pull yeah yeah it's it's it, it's really yeah that's a great question too so you know after you pull you missed some of the little ones right and so the little ones are still there i don't waste my time on the little ones until they start getting bigger because they can sometimes outcompete themselves so what i do is i try to get everything to grow on the same life cycle or life stage so I'll do one big pull and then walk away, come back two years later, flush the whole area again. Because if you have things start to stagger at different growth, it's really hard to suppress all that reproductive output. But if you can get it to kind of all grow uniformly, you can do these kind of effective sweeps. Um, spraying seedlings, I'd be probably more into propane torching the seedlings because getting that chem to actually hit that plant when it's so small is pretty tricky. Okay, man, this is like incredible. We're getting so many good questions. Um, this has gotta be a record for questions I love. And we have the time, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. So how have you seen land management strategies change when it comes to preventing wildfire? That's a high level question. Um, but yeah, I'd be curious about your thoughts on this as well. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. So, you know, I come from a, a mixed background of um, working for the Conservation Corps. And so, you know, I started out doing uh, fire fuel reduction projects before they were cool. I like to say uh, 25 years ago when it was just local fire districts going, hey, yeah, get rid of all that vegetation. So here I am, you know, 18, going out with a chainsaw and just killing everything. And I remember seeing some different things thinking, wait, is, is that bad too? There's a lot of that one thing, but here's something a little different. What What is this thing? And I said to the boss, hey, what, what is it? Hey, don't worry about that. We're here to just get it done. So, well, I, I, I would just, I'm just curious, you know? That's what led me to CNPS and going on hikes on the weekend to try to learn about the diversity of plants. And it turns out, you know, you can do both. And I ended up, you know, leading my own conservation court crew for three years. And I got that same project, went back to that same site. This time, instead of mass, you know, getting rid of clearing everything, I just did selective, I prioritized all the invasives. And we just limbed up all the trees. We did a shaded fuel break. 
And in the end, it was an 80 foot pile of debris by 15 feet. And the fire department came by and went, wow, awesome job. I don't have to kill one native plant, right? So that's when I really got kind of excited about how you can marry, you know, habitat restoration and invasive plant control with vegetation management at large. If we are managing vegetation, we should know how to manage that type of vegetation. And so what I've seen is as the resources have amplified to do fuel reduction work, there's a lot of uninformed work happening on the ground with contractors, I, I, I call them like hack job contractors, where you just strip all that biomass out of there, it's out of sight, out of mind, they collect the checks and then it comes back worse. So that's really what uh, I don't like seeing happening, but I think, you know, awareness is growing. Um, fire responders want to know more about the vegetation and how to manage it properly. Um, I think we're, we're, we're getting somewhere, but we need to get ahead of the curve because um, I'd say right now we're losing the battle. Yeah, and I'm going to weigh in on, weigh in on that a little bit too. Um, I've been in the fire service, well, I won't tell you how old I am, but since, you know, 1979. And when I was a boot firefighter, um, I mean, we couldn't even imagine doing prescribed burns way back then not to the degree that we're doing them now. So I think that's one area where um, we've gotten to where most of us feel more comfortable managing prescribed fire than we used to. We used to be scared to death of it when we we're, you know, putting it on the ground, um, you know, worried that it would get out of control, et cetera. But we've learned so much and, and learned that, you know, if we make fuel breaks in the right space and, do some thinning ahead of putting fire on the ground. You know, we can manage that tool pretty well these days. And a lot, lot more people, I think, are a little more comfortable with it in general. You know, there was a lot of fear years ago around it, but not as much anymore. And then the other thing I think that has evolved over the years, and you mentioned it, is the environmental concerns related to the fuels reduction work that we're doing. We want to do them as environmentally friendly as we can. So next Good question point. is, uh, what is your, okay, this is an area where you, you know, I knew about shaded fuel breaks, but I didn't know how well they functioned environmentally. So you're going to love responding to this one. What's your experience with shaded fuel breaks? Are they done well and do they do any good? Yeah, I, uh, I'm a big fan of shaded fuel breaks. Um, once you clear cut and once you daylight space, you've basically just created a ton of disturbance and sunlit the whole area. And what you're going to get is a bunch of weedy growth that's never going to end. So if you want to create a space that you're going to routinely mow forever, then I would go for the clear cut. But if you're trying to preserve shade, which is actually a really important resource because it allows the understory to hold water, right? If it's not exposed, exposed to direct sun, it can hold on to that water. And that's so key to suppressing fire. And so, you know, a, a, a well done shaded fuel break is a beautiful thing. You've got the, the live oaks out there, right? Casting so much shade, you don't have to water them a drip. And they get through the entire Mediterranean summer throwing shade for not a single dollar and support all of those understory plants. So losing that, if you were to quantify the cost of, of daylighting all of our woodlands, it's a, it's a scary thing to think about because they're hard earned. They take a long time to form and, and pass that shade. Yes. Yeah, I, I think they're really beneficial. Um, Here's a good question. Uh, would grazing be a solution to treating broom uh, as a follow-up treatment after the larger plants have been pulled in the first year? Mm, that's that's an interesting concept. That is. Um, yeah, I think, you know, broom is toxic, right? So a lot of livestock doesn't like to eat it. 
uh i've heard you can spray it with like molasses to make it more enticing for livestock and i bet you goats would go after it regardless so um you know the main consideration i have on that from seeing grazing go south on um broom projects which has happened more than i'd like to admit uh goats or livestock will eat everything else before they eat broom uh we had we had them penned off on a madrone forest and they stripped every madrone of its bark wiped out the every tree on the thing before they even hit a single french broom plant so i would just be really cautious of the species composition that's existing in that space before you introduce the livestock if it's like a degraded area and there's not a lot of native species there and you're just really looking to suppress all that weedy growth then I think it could be a, a good solution. You know, with, with grazing, it's all about the duration and concentration of the pen, right? So it, it's tricky business actually when done right. Yeah. A um, couple more questions and we're almost out of time. Uh, marine habitat restoration with veg management, you know, holistic approach is so needed. Thank you for your framing on the, of the issue. Oh, okay, that was just a, uh, a comment. Thank you for the comment. Uh, I dropped it in my question bin, thinking it was a question. Okay, this may be our last question. Uh, if you cannot grow your own native plants, do you rec recommend finding a native plant wholesaler to cover an acre that has broom removed? The native plants to replace the broom would be very expensive. Right, right. You know what's going on right now in the native plant nursery industry is they've all come together and they're forming these giant farms of native plants to do what they call seed amplification. And so it's become easier than it ever has to set up these contract grows to amplify native seed. And so it's an exciting scene in the restoration field right now. So all the big seed companies, I can't remember, all Hedgerow Farms, SNS Seeds, they're all connected now. I think Pacific Seeds is the third. So you can reach out to them. They'll even come out to your watershed, collect that seed, bring it back, grow it in an agricultural setting, and amplify it into the thousands. So it's a it's a new trend in uh, restoration. That's that's a a great resource we have. Um, okay, I think let's see. I think that's all the questions. Let me double check. Um, Oh, a couple more just came in. I love it. Um, let's see. Here go. Um, on a place like Fitch Mountain, is there a grass seed mix that you could recommend? That That's a great. Is defined as an oak woodland. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's a great question. So I, I studied grasses in grad school because they were so tricky. I just really wanted to understand them. And, uh, and I learned a lot. Uh, they're they're all a little different, and most of the grasses uh, can't handle full sun. So a lot of grasses like part shade, so they'll lend themselves to the sh um, the shaded fuel break. In there, um, in the shaded areas, you can do the fescues. Um, oh, am I forgetting the name of this? Oh, the melicas. The melicas are wonderful. The festucas and the melicas are probably your way to go in a, a forest environment. In the riparian area, uh, any place where there's active drainage, I like to use Elmus glaucus, the blue rye, it grows gangbusters and comes on fast. Um, if you're out there in the full sun, it's a battle. It's going to take a while to establish native grasses, but once they're established, they will live a really long time. In, in any full sun area, you're looking at uh, purple needle grass, the type of pulchra, the state grass, and then there's also Danthonia californica, or oat grass, and those ones can can really hack it in the full sun. Okay. Um, I think that is it for questions, and that's good because we're out of time. I'm going to go a couple minutes over so we get our full hour because we did start a couple minutes late. That works. Um, but yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jason, for the presentation. It's amazing. Uh, I can't wait to see how many views we get 
over time on this particular presentation on our YouTube channel. Uh, I'm sure we are going to get a lot. Um, and I just want to let people know that, um, let's see, don't forget to, um, let's see, register uh, Zoom meeting. I thought I had the link for our next event here, um, but I don't think we did. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, check us out on YouTube channel. Check us out on our website. Uh, I also want to remind folks that we are a private nonprofit. We do accept donations. Uh, we are mostly grant funded, but also to some degree we are donation funded. So we appreciate any help we can get there. Uh, and thank you for my team. Uh, Marika, Emily, Harry, and Becca. And again, thank you, Jason, for this fantastic presentation. And also thank you for all of you guys that attended. Uh, and remember next month uh, on our speaker series, we're gonna have Chief Ben Nichols from Cal Fire providing us with the seasonal outlook for the fire season, what it might hold in store for us. Uh, Marika, did I capture everything? I'm probably forgetting something. Nope, you did great. Thank you. Just wanted to pop in and say thanks so much, Jason. Thanks everyone for attending. All right, great. Thank you thanks all. Thanks so much, you guys. And uh, yeah, have a great weekend. And hopefully we'll see you guys again next month for our next presentation, if not perhaps sooner. Yeah, enjoy spring.